Tim Graham and Friends is brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. CTBK is a leading accounting firm with a growing team of accountants and business consultants with roots in Amherst, New York. CTBK pairs every project with a focus on a human connection between its team and the client for assurance, accounting, taxes, litigation support, and advice on mergers and acquisitions, CTBK is available and ready to solve any issue your business faces. For a consultation or to request a quote, call 716-630-2400. Again, that's 716-630-2400. CTBK, over a quarter century of proven accounting and business excellence for Western New York and beyond. Thanks for joining Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK. I am Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Matthew Fairburn, also of The Athletic, and Jonah Bronstein of Bronstein Global Network Systems. And it's been a, well, a bit of a peculiar winter, I think, in that the Bills have, and I think you can argue, unprecedented stability. So there's really nothing going on. There's no questions regarding the quarterback or which tools they need to surround the quarterback with going out in free agency, moving up in the draft. Um, they're a good team. They have their coordinators back. Uh, they have all the key members of their staff back. The general manager's in place. You don't have to worry about that for years. So what a perfect time for the Buffalo Sabres to fill that winter void and take center stage when nobody needs to talk anything about the bills. And they have just continually uh, reminded us how irrelevant they are and totally unwatchable guys. I don't know. I mean, I know you follow, uh, you follow it. Hudson, let's let, let's go ahead and let Hudson go. No, you met you meet Hudson. He's Matthew not pleased. Fairburn's dog Hudson. He's clearly not pleased about the current state of the Sabres. Yeah, he's got, got, a, he's got a few thoughts. <laughs> you guys even try to watch the games? Oh, Jonah, you get paid. You have to watch some some of the games anyway. Yeah, I try to pay attention. But um, if it was if you're talking about for entertainment, I'm not really a Sabres fan and never been a Sabres fan. But if I was, I would not try to watch the games. I would be trying to do anything I could to avoid having to watch something that made me sad and depressed or however Sabres fans are feeling these days. Yeah. I watched last week. I I chipped in for, for John Vogel covering a game because I had offered at the beginning of the year, you know, maybe he'd need some relief um, simply with the load of the schedule, not even factoring in how good the team may or may not be. And, he took me up on it um, in the middle of this particularly rough stretch. And about two periods in, I was thinking, yeah, I know why he, he uh, took me up on this. So like, I don't even know how you continue to write about this team. And this is the first time I've done it. <laughs> I was you like, to see a fight that, that saved me in the third period. It was like, all right, there's something to write about. There's a little, there's a player here that, that cares that's doing something that has a little bit of, um, you know, energy, but, you know, throughout the weekend. Yeah. I, I do try to watch cause I know we, we talk about them and, you know, in case John needs me to fill in, I, I just like to be up to date with what's going on and I enjoy hockey, but I find myself following a familiar pattern of watching a period or two and being like, yep, I've seen this one before. Oh, it's, it's a repeat. Like I'll turn this one off and find something else because it seems like the games all follow a very similar pattern and they're, you know, frankly, just a predictable and not competitive, you know, night after night, especially now, even worse with with all Mark hurt. I feel like they're they don't even stand a chance most nights. Tim, you raise a good point. I think it, I don't know. Actually, I haven't read anything about it, but have you seen much about the ratings? Are the, are the ratings up down the same? Because I don't know. You know, I don't get MSG, so I can't even watch every game if I want to without, you know, going somewhere else. But so I watch some games and others I don't. It's not really related to whether I want to watch or not. But it, it seems to me from following on Twitter and the way people talk about it, that people are right now more into hate watching this team than they are in tuning them out and pretending they don't exist. Yeah, I think that's accurate. You tune in, you want to see them show uh, 
a little sign of life. But yeah, I think people have gotten to the point, much like they did during the tank with the group howling and the cheering for uh, the, the Coyotes to win and the Sabres to get scored upon in their own arena and as, as uh, subversive as all that was. Um, I think this is worse. Uh, I think this is worse than the bankruptcy years when Gary Bettman ran the team. Uh, because uh, the Sabres were plunged into bankruptcy by their owners in handcuffs uh, and their arrest of the Reguses. And, um, and I don't know if social media plays a role in that, in that um, everybody can communicate in real time during the course of a game. I think a lot of people are hate watching, doom watching uh, altogether. Um, a, a victory, uh, a goal here or there, really doesn't matter it, but it seems that there's substance to each loss. And I think that uh, at least it seems to me, Sabres fans have gotten to the point where losses will mean change or wake the Pagulas up. Uh, And when I say change, I mean, fire Ralph Kruger or make a major trade at this point, getting on a three or four game winning streak, isn't going to do anything. The Sabres are going to miss the playoffs for a 10th straight year. Uh, This team's, just dead they're zombies and um so really yeah i think the only reason to watch is to check to make to make sure you know that that nothing well there's no reason to there's no reason to watch there's no reason to watch to me the reason to watch or the intrigue comes with like the individuals and figuring out who could exist here long term and what it looks like and how it might fit together if there's anything worthwhile and to me like watching a lot has to do with Jack Eichel and wondering like where is the production and when is it going to come will it ever you know and and kind of following his body language and and everything that that goes along with that and same goes for guys like Taylor Hall Jeff Skinner uh, these big name you know talented players that just aren't producing and Darlene, I mean, you could go down the list of guys that were top 10 picks or just highly regarded, highly paid guys that aren't doing anything. And, you know, I think there's it's a still fascinating a, story. All of it yeah. put together is a fascinating. Yeah. So it's like you're watching a TV show more than you're watching a hockey team. And I guess watching any sport is really you're watching a form of reality TV anyhow. But at least with these Especially sabers. Now, right. Over. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, you know, and not to get off on a tangent, I think that any sports news uh, uh, leagues now view as all just part of the soap opera, whether it's off field uh, problems, uh, you know, suspension, everything is news, everything is attention, everything feeds into the, uh, the series, uh, the next episode. Um, That's what it yeah, feels Matthew, like with the I Sabres. That- there, there's something every day. There was the Cousins fight, which – in, it, in and of itself was like, oh, here's a, a promising young player showing a little bit of, you know, showing that he cares and being the guy to try to wake the team up, which, you know, the whole fighting thing I think is a little archaic, but clearly it, he just cared, which was like a, a change of pace. But then it become every, even the good things become a head scratcher because after the game, it's like, that's as fired up as we've been all season. And it's like that you know, it took that, you know, a 20 year old kid dropping the gloves, like, and then Skinner scores, you know? And so it's like, Oh, that's a a good thing that happened. And then Ralph Kruger comes out with a quote. That's, you know, kind of a a pot shot seemingly at, at Jeff Skinner. It's like every day, you know, and then before heading into the weekend, it was like Kevin Adams spoke and I thought handled himself fairly well, uh, all things considered with some of the, the questions. And I think it it lowered the temperature. It was a Doug Whaley-esque press conference on the media's end in terms of the bottled up, ang- you know, the, the grenades that were being tossed, but Adams handled it a million times better. And if Doug was- Whaley handles his final news conference the way Kevin Adams handled Friday, Doug Whaley might still be the general manager. <laughs> Yeah, if he was, you know, prepared in that, or at way, least would have kept, wouldn't probably would have maybe would have kept going a little bit longer anyway. I thought Kevin Adams did a really good job, especially with some questions that weren't really questions so much as they were, you know, 
attacks or insults or look at me posturing. Uh, it was an interesting news conference. It was, it was a little, and I get it because I was a part of one that was very similar with Doug Whaley where, you know, now it's a little different. Doug Whaley didn't talk for a long time. Kevin, Kevin Adams, Adams talked last month. Yeah. He talked like three weeks ago. So this idea that he was hiding isn't totally true. He's also new, very new on the job and sort of the wrong guy to direct the vitriol at, unlike Whaley, who had been there a while and gone through a couple coaches. So some differences, but I do understand that sometimes when there's, there's an expectation when the fan base wants blood that the media is going to perform to that. And, you know, it's kind of silly when you see it play out, you know, from a little bit of a distance, like I, I did on Friday, but I, I understand some of it. I just thought Kevin Adams did a really good job. Now that scores him no points, right? He's not doing a particularly good job as the general manager so far, and neither is the coach. Um, but I did think in the face of some, you know, over the top heat, not that the heat's not deserved, but the way it was delivered was a little over the top at times. I thought he did an excellent job now. So you get that, right. That's like a TV show for me. That happens at four 30. I'm on Facebook, like watching the live stream. I'm like, all right, like, let's go. Let's kick back and just watch this. It was like a TV show. And then they play the game. So it's like, okay, let's see if it, if it did something like it, it's all part of very much a, it's like a, a soap opera at this point. And that's more than you can say about NHL teams. I will say that. Um, but certainly not the type of team that Sabres fans want, not the type of hockey experience they're trying to participate in. I do agree that Kevin Adams did a very good job in a tough spot for himself and for the people on that call, you know, all the things you mentioned, Matt. But I would not say, as Tim said, that it changed the temperature very much because I do think the Sabres fans are still out for blood. They still want to see this coach fired. It didn't change the performance of the team that much over the weekend. Um, people are still looking for something. And when you say out for blood, I mean, not to sound crass, but it's, they're very, they're out for Kim Pagula's blood specifically. And it's not Terry and it's not the general manager. And it's really not anybody else. There's no. It's Ralph Krieger. And, the coach. and Ralph Krieger. But I, I find and Jack to an that, extent that like Jack that, becomes the target a lot of times right. too. But I guess, I guess, well, maybe I'm wrong then. I, I feel like a lot of the vitriol has been directed directly at Kim Pagula as if she has more sway over the team than Terry Pagula. I guess she does as the team president. And especially today, you saw she was on Good Morning Football and there was a, the tweet got taken over by Sabres fans whining and complaining about Sabres issues on that uh, you know promotion tweet for her football interview. I think Terry gets some of it, but only some of it becomes their own doing. They do these behind the scenes shows, you know, with how the draft came together and people will take a snippet of what Terry said or the fact that Terry's even there as an indication of his involvement. And, you know, I do think there's, uh, you know, an element of people wondering how, whether they're more involved, their hands are more in this hockey team and the roster than they are in the football team. And if that's maybe a big cause for some of these problems. So yeah, I don't think there's anything Kevin Adams could have done or said on Friday that would have cooled the temperature of the fan base whatsoever. What he did was he didn't make it worse. So like we were talking about with Whaley, he didn't, you know, he didn't, he took the target off of himself in a yeah, way. I think he lowered the temperature for himself. You're right. I think that you, you can't, you, you can at least look at it and say, all right, Kevin Adams took all the questions, took some really over the top theatrical attacks from the media, which I found strange, unprofessional. I'll just say unprofessional. I mean, you can't, it's journalism 101 and you can't just, I mean, you can't say, Hey, uh, you're pathetic. Uh, how do you fix it? You know, right. there's, you don't or insult, insult somebody as part of the question be, uh, just to you know, show that you, that you're we, the tough guy, right? It, you're performing to somebody, including probably yourself. And the idea that he's not available is simply not really true. Um, if I, this is a free piece of PR advice for um, anybody with it, with the powers, powers that be that, that may be listening. If I'm a GM, I'm probably out, I'm talking every week. 
just to remove that barrier of like, oh, I'm I'm not accountable. How sick would these guys get of talking to him after a while? Right. Yeah. Half hour every week. You'd run out of questions. You'd run out of questions. It'd be like, wow, this guy is the most accountable guy in the league. Uh, look at him answer all these questions. And it's a half hour every week. Just, all right, this is going to be the day. Maybe it'll be early in the morning. You knock it out after your morning workout, like talk to the media for half an hour, once a week, every other week, if that's too much of a burden. But I don't know the idea that, and I don't even know that it's an accepted idea so much among the fan base, but it becomes built up in media, if a guy does not talk for a while of this guy is not facing the the heat. I don't know that fans really care that much about like how often the Pagulas talk or anything like that, or how often a guy like Kevin Adams talks, but it's probably one of the most easiest ways to disarm the media is to just talk. And I think Kevin that's Adams where, did. where Kim Pagula brings a lot of the vitriol upon herself or whoever is advising her to do it this way is that she has a bill's, podcast she's doing media when it comes to the bills but when it comes to the sabers she's invisible and so people can easily compare apples to apples and say you do this for the bills where are you with the sabers um and so i think that creates a lot of the um a lot of the the frustration too from the fans is that there is an element that the ownership at least is hiding. Maybe not Kevin Adams, but the ownership is, is hiding when they're all too pleased to be, um, to be out there with us when their football team's winning. And it's hardly ever as bad as you think, right? Like Kevin Adams had it as bad as you can have it on Friday, I think, when holding a media availability and proved that he could handle that fine. If Kevin Adams comes out this Friday and talks, it, I don't think there would be, you know, like you said, there would be no more of the, the same stuff. How many times can you ask, why haven't you fired Ralph Kruger? Um, you know, there was an element, you know, there was things learned uh, on Friday, but the more you do it, the less, the more that temperature comes down and the more, um, you know, you, you can control your message a little bit better. And that's probably, like you said, a lesson for the Pagulas as well. I, I remember every time we talked to Terry and Kim at the owners meetings, which was really like the time that they would talk, it would become like a mix of sabers and bills because uh, they don't do many of those. And, you know, all bills reporters, but some who do both. And um, afterwards, there's been a few times where it was, you know, Terry would be like, oh, that, that wasn't so bad. And it's like, well, well yeah, well, what do you think? Like, you know, what do you think it's going to be? Um, especially if you time it right and you do it more frequently, uh, you can only muster the energy to, to perform the way some, you know, media members were on Friday for so long uh, or so often before it becomes worn out, I think, and loses its whatever effect it may or may not have. So, I don't know. It's it, And it's not even just a, oh, I'd want to hear from these people more often. I just think it's the easiest way. Like make people sick of you. You talk so much, like, like Sean McDermott talks so much that there are days where like three people ask him a question because it's like, we're out of things to talk to this guy about. He talks four times a week during the season. Like that's plenty, you know, it's actually three and then a fourth after a game. So uh, I think the more you do it, you know, the, the less heat you end up taking, but there's not too much that they can do strategically to, to take some of the Sabres heat off them because it's that much of a mess. Yeah. It reminds me, you you know, your plan there. Um, when uh, I was talking with uh, some reporters who cover the Jacksonville Jaguars, when Gus Bradley uh, was the head coach and they had such an open media policy uh, in which media was allowed to, observe all practices. Uh, they, they actually said they wanted less <laughs> because it became, they couldn't get their work done. And it becomes a problem when you talk to, when you, when you factor in the competition aspect of it, of a reporter, I need to write my story, but I'm afraid that my competitor is going to be out of practice and learn something that I won't. Let's say somebody gets hurt or whatever. Somebody's taken the first team uh, snaps so I have to be out there too. So they started coming up, you know, they just basically went to PR and said, can you, can you eliminate some of our access? 
Um, not quite the same. I'm sure that wouldn't happen. There's a, there's a, there's a wide gap in between what the Sabres are doing with Kevin Adams and Gus Bradley with the Jaguars. But um, it's to your point that we can become sick of it. Like there, there is a such thing as too much access. Uh, and it, it, it's kind of, well, I don't need to keep repeating what you're saying, but yeah, I like that, don't make it, a it new, underscores you. Don't make it a television show for me as a, sort of an outsider um, to a certain extent. It, like, became, oh, Kevin, yeah, it was Kevin Adams TV is talking. And, right. Kevin Adams is talking. I'm all over that. Like, let's see what's going on there. And that creates, I think, you know, now we're getting into psychology and whatever else, but I think that creates that feeling or that need for some to ask questions that, and I say this as somebody who I think has been guilty of that aspect of probably crossing the line of a question in a, in a press conference, you know, and it's, I think there's a human nature element of like, oh, this is a big deal. Kevin Adams is talking. I better, I got to get him, you know, I got to put him on the spot. I got to ask him the hard question. Yeah. Hold his feet to the fire, hold him accountable. Um, You know, I like to think I've learned a little more tact in that as I've, you know, gone through these situations a little more often, but it's not an event if it happens a lot. Um, And I think that's, you know, one of those lessons that, um, not many organizations really take too much to heart. I guess the problem with that becomes if you're in a moment or you're in a time of crisis or there's, you know, tough things going on, you know, and you need to take a, a step back from it, you know, doing it every week or every other week, then it becomes, Hey, why isn't this guy talking? It's a little bit more noticeable, but you've also built up to that point, such a rapport and so much comfortability doing it that, professional Any, goodwill also anything like, that, well, yeah anything that comes your way is not doing it this week is easy. No, all right no sweat so, we'll get you next week right yeah like or we're going to push it out a couple of days or you know things are getting we're going to switch up the cadence and like you said there's probably some people that would be like good you know here's this friday afternoon call that i have to be on because you know my competition is going to be on there but most of the time it's pretty uneventful um it's not must see tv as friday was so yeah, like people aren't tuning in to hear Ralph Kruger talk because he talks so much. Now that's required and there's games and everything like that. But, I, you know, you run the risk, at, probably if you're an owner, of making it like a Jerry Jones situation where he talks so much that it's, um, you know, obnoxious to a point. But he's also, a you know, obnoxious person in a lot of ways. Um, they, and. The it Sabres would have a everything. long way to go to get to that point. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think you just get better at it and there, it, it would be a much different uh, dynamic. No, nobody's, nobody's asking for my input, but um, maybe there's, maybe there's some passersby on this call that, um, that would consider it. I don't know. I wouldn't really benefit me much if Kevin Adams spoke every week, but I think it would benefit him a lot. And I think it would, probably change the temperature of the room uh, every time he does sit down to speak. And none of that is fixing the problems that are happening on the ice, but it was just kind of an observation I, I had on Friday when I was listening to that. It's like, why don't they just do this? All? Especially because he's good at it. He's like really good at it. Um, you know, kind of just letting stuff roll off and then coming at you with a pretty vanilla response. Uh, I thought, but also giving it some information. I thought, I just thought he was, uh, like you said, didn't take the uh, target off Ralph's back at all, but handled himself fine. If he was no good at it, like, I don't know that having Whaley speak every week would have been a good idea, but it might've been because then he maybe would have gotten better at it. Those are all very early that, on. Yeah. Have him, you know, just introduce him to small groups or whatever. But yeah, that was, uh, he was not, he was not groomed for that aspect of his job very well. Um, It's part of what's worked so well with the bills and look at how the bills are covered and how the sabers are covered. Uh, And maybe we're getting too deep into the weeds, but I feel like our audience is used to these journalism type of discussions uh, from us, but they are covered like drastically different by a lot of the same people, uh, which is fascinating to me. Uh, And it goes to our conversation of Sabres Twitter versus Bill's Twitter and obviously the results on the field. But go back to the beginning of Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean and how that was covered. 
and how the beginning of Kevin Adams is covered. Um, I just think it's totally different. And a lot of that had to do with how accessible those guys were, how open they were, you know, Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean to having that relationship, building that trust. And people don't want to burn that access. People don't want to, you know, be the one to step out on a ledge unless your last name is Sullivan. Uh, but <laughs> other than that, you know, I, so I think, you know, when you get to the point with the Sabres and you're like, well, what, what the hell, this is what the fan base wants and nobody's given any access anyways, like screw it. It was like Rex, it's like Rex Ryan with the bills. He was too good to have any sort of relationship with anybody in Buffalo. So when it came time to need some goodwill, there was none there because he was, he was terrible at that. It's like Andrew Cuomo. He could use some goodwill from the press these days. He has none. He has none. No it's like, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Charlie Pierce at uh, Esquire wrote the column last week or week and a half ago. And the headline <laughs> called Cuomo a dickhead. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. I'll say that. I was laughing too hard. I don't know if I enunciated that. It called him a dickhead uh, and said, this is what you get when you're a dickhead just for so long. And uh, it's kind of like, Hey man, I mean, you could have been everybody's hero. You were a superstar, but uh, you know, nobody likes you. So uh, anyway, yeah, you're right. Um, I wonder, well, one quick point. I wonder yeah. with what Matt mentioned kind of comparing different Bills regimes and general managers that were more accessible than others in the current state with the Sabres. I feel like Doug Whaley didn't talk a lot because he wasn't always on the same page as his head coach, whether it was Doug Marone or Rex Ryan. And there were maybe specifically when it was Rex Ryan, that whole one voice thing, and they weren't put out there to ever contradict each other at certain times of the season. And I don't know if that's exactly the dynamic going on with the Sabres, but it does sort of seem like Kevin. Adams well, Just for posterity. For the one voice thing didn't be, didn't come into play until Sean McDermott was hired. Okay. All right. So you could do, you know, we were able to interview Doug Whaley at the whim of the bills PR staff at the time, but when Sean McDermott came in and there was a new PR person added, then it became one voice. And it wasn't, as you, we now know, they still don't have that policy of one voice under the same head coach and the same PR executive. Um, that it was a non Doug Whaley voice that the bills realized they don't want Doug Whaley talking. Yeah. It was one voice that they didn't want talking and it was Doug's right. <laughs> everything but, else was, you know, when Brandon Bean got hired, it was, it was, uh, that probably went out the window. So, um, there but, was a period I, of time though, before that, I don't know if they use the same terminology where Doug Whaley wouldn't talk at certain times of the year, and then a lot of teams would turn into that. the off season and Doug Whaley would talk and Rex Ryan would go quiet, believe it or not, for a little while. Um, maybe I'm blending different eras together. And they no, kinda, I think that's They kind of do that now uh, to an extent. Um, I would say Brandon Bean will end up talking more. Uh, neither have spoken since the end of season press conferences, but they'll, they'll let Brandon, you know, do most of the talking on draft weekend. McDermott will talk a little bit, but there is an element of that with Whaley. I think that he was, they were worried about those mixed messages. And, and I guess that's what happens when you have, it, it just goes to show that the availability or the access or the coverage is never the problem. Uh, it's just a symptom of whatever your problem is. And so if you're not on the same page and you're worried about not having the same message out there, that probably says something about the problem you have as an organization that your head coach and general manager can't agree what to say when they open their mouths with a microphone in front of it. And if you have that problem, then sure, maybe don't have, you know, your general manager talk all the time. But uh, if you have that problem, then you've got bigger problems than, you know, some mean tweets or tough questions. Mean tweets with Kevin Adams might actually, that would, that would probably lower the temperature, you know, mean tweets with Ralph Kruger. 
<laughs> they might be too mean. No, I think so, that they, even if it were the same tweets, I don't know. There's some, I think people just have don't give a damn what Ralph Kruger has to say anymore because it's just been empty. Uh, he was all style, no substance in that he was supposed to be this transformative charismatic figure. And two weeks ago, he's saying Jack Eichel, their cocky franchise player uh, has lost his confidence. Well, how does that happen? Master motivator. How did look? None of it added up. None of it has added up. And he's, you know, the, the Jeff Skinner contradictions and why he would bench him and the gobbledygook answers that he gives now to, to pressing questions. It's just, there's nothing there. The players have obviously checked out on him. Um, there's just nothing there. There's no substance. Well, I think there's a lot of substance in what he says to the media. He's actually as forthcoming as any coach I've ever covered. And I think a lot of times he's right, but you're right. Sometimes it's, it go, he's a better television analyst than he is a coach. It seems at this point, he's better at, telling us why Jack Eichel isn't playing well than actually getting Jack Eichel to play well. And the same thing with Skinner. I think there were calls from the fans and the media that he should be scratched because he wasn't producing before Ralph Kruger got around to doing that. And then all of a sudden it became, you know, Ralph Kruger disrespecting Jeff Skinner. But I think Jeff Skinner played his way into that doghouse that maybe does or doesn't exist on his own. I don't know. Maybe there's ways Ralph Kruger used him wrong, but, you know, Jeff Skinner shouldn't be sitting there blaming others for why he was scratched for a couple of games. No, I would agree with that, Jonah. But my, my response or just the counter to that is there are other, why aren't other players healthy scratch? Like it seemed as though Jeff Skinner was singled out um, and he plays a role in which he's supposed to score. But isn't that uh, a thing hockey coaches do? I remember there were games, there were Phil Housley wouldn't do that. There were situations a couple of years back. I can't think of the exact players, but visiting teams would come in and a guy had gone three or four games without a oh, point. Lindy Ruff used to do it with Thomas yeah. Vanek. He would do it with J.P. Dumont. Uh, he would do it with, uh, you know, any number of guys. If they were slumping, he'd set them out to teach them a lesson. And Zach Parisi, just a few weeks, just like last week, I think Zach Parisi had a pretty similar ordeal in Minnesota. It was always, about, it's always for a yeah. game, you know, maybe two yeah. if something crazy happened, you know, especially on, when you're a forward, because you can be blended in. There's all different kinds of things you can do with a forward. Um, you know, Dimitri Kalinin was another one who would get the healthy scratch every now and then uh, because he wasn't, uh, he, he'd, he'd lost his game. Um, so, yeah, I get that. But to have it go on for how many games was it with Skinner? Three? Yeah. Four? Three? Three. Okay. I mean, that's a long time. I mean, that is it just, yeah, it's, it was peculiar. I'd, I'd and his say... reasoning and his, him talking uh, the report uh, about uh, whether Skinner's agent had, had met with the team or not and him not knowing and the, the Jack Eichel injury makes it, getting that all screwed up. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the guy's just not paying any attention. Like almost like he shows up to work every day and he's like, all right, what happened? What's happened? Uh, what's happened today? All right, let's get out there on the ice. You know, he, I don't know. He just, there just seems to be a major disconnect with the guy who's supposed to be all, not only a master motivator, but an organizational wizard. And I see can't. a lot of people say, bump him up, you know, kick him upstairs and get a real coach. It's like, well, the last few weeks, I think have ruined that. He's lost. Yeah. He's lost any credibility. If there was ever a hope of that, it feels like that's going to be a really hard thing to sell when this yeah, who's all... going to trust him in the organization. I mean, he, he, he proved nothing with his coaching. Uh, and so much of his coaching acumen is based on all the things that you need within an organization, communication, motivation, um, you know, whatever ideas he has organizationally or implementing new ideas. I mean, maybe if he had accomplished something two or three years ago, you know, gotten them deep within the playoffs and showed some things and then it fell apart. All right. Maybe you say this is an asset that we really need to procure uh, or need to preserve here, but he has shown to me and based on the way his players are playing and based on what Kevin, I mean, Kevin Adams, like you say, he didn't take the, the target off Ralph Kruger's back uh, in during that Friday news conference. 
all the all the communicate all the things that uh, the reflections of Ralph Kruger are all terrible. And uh, I would see no reason to keep him on in, in the front office. And furthermore, if you do that, you're pretty much kneecapping Kevin Adams, aren't you? I mean, it, what role to do what? I mean, yeah, it would empty out entirely those words that Kevin Adams said on Friday that he does have the authority to remove Ralph Kruger as the coach, because if it becomes a thing where they say, oh, we're going to kick him upstairs and you know, give them some sort of promotion or whatever, then it's like, well, I guess you don't have that authority. Yeah. Well, what not do you make anymore. him assistant now, GM? Right. I mean, Essentially make him, now make work, work for the guy who just fired him. President of hockey operations. Like, well, now he has the authority to remove you technically. So that's where I think it, the whole, a month ago, beginning of the season in the off season, you could have sold that as an organizational restructure in some way. Kevin Adams is going to be GM or assistant GM and Kruger is going to be president of hockey operations or GM. And he's going to help Kevin Adams along because he's inexperienced and we're going to bring in an experienced coach and they're going to be sort of a three headed, you know, power triangle that's going to start steering this thing in a different direction. And, but now after all the things you just mentioned and after the way that they've played, look, like, Hockey coaches aren't like football coaches. I think that's where things get mixed up, you know, and probably all the way up to the ownership level of, oh, we're going to let Sean McDermott, you know, make this building in his image and it's going to take time and all this. I mean, that's not really hockey. Like that's not the same thing. Uh, You know, when a really good coach becomes available in hockey, You see teams scramble to fire their own coach if he's not good enough. Or if you go on a five-game losing streak, it's not to say that a hockey coach cannot change the building the way that Sean McDermott has changed one Bills drive. They just don't need four years to do it. You don't need to say, well, we need to have patience with Ralph Kruger because it's only year two. He's coached a lot of games. Like, Claude Julian's out there. Like, go get him. Like, go bring in Claude Julian and let him – you know, guide Kevin Adams along in making some of these decisions. You know, Ralph Kruger, I, the one thing that I do, I don't know if sympathize is the right word. A huge criticism of Ralph Kruger is, oh, the system is broken. In what way? You know, what system? Like how many people complain about the system without being able to define it or point out specific elements of it that are quote unquote broken? They don't have a lot of good players and the good players that they do have are not playing well. Now his lineup decisions his his uh, the roles he puts certain guys in. Sure. That's pretty easy as obvious stuff to call out. Lack um, of goaltending, which lack of goaltending is Kevin Adams shoulders, massive, uh, a massive problem, but the system, I don't know. Like I would wonder what I'd be very curious to hear like the specific well, from criticisms. From my understanding, outlined. It's, it's a defensive system, and it's a very offense-oriented roster. And maybe it's not a bad system, but the system is not fitting the talent and the players maybe aren't sticking to the system or are playing poorly when they're in the system. And when they do score goals, it's outside the system or it's a special teams play, and it's a little different. That's my interpretation of it. And I think – I'm not so sure Ralph Kruger is this bad of a coach or that he needs to be fired because he doesn't know what he's doing, but it clearly seems like he should not be coaching this roster – and you can't have him pick the next coach because he's probably going to pick a coach that employs a similar system. It's going to be the same bad fit. Um, That's what I see is that maybe, and you see this in hockey all the time, this team doesn't, this coach doesn't fit this team and something needs to change in that dynamic one way or the other. Yeah. I think there's elements of overly defensive hockey and what they do and what some of the specific players maybe are asked to do. And I think that's what, a lot of system becomes a catch all for that. And it becomes, you know, the, the one complaint that people can um, easily point to. They, they just have a lot of, I think the biggest issue with Ralph Kruger is they have a massive amount of underperforming players, like individual talents who are underperforming for one reason or another. Uh, You can blame the system, but 
I don't know that they're that good of a hockey team. Nobody before the season thought they were that good of a hockey team. They have Kyle Pozo playing on the first line some nights. He probably shouldn't even have a jersey, uh, you know, on a lot of, on a better team. He probably wouldn't have a, a jersey a lot of nights. And he stays in the lineup and Skinner goes out. He's alienated guys like Skinner. He's not able to motivate certain players. Taylor Hall's not playing well. Um, so it's a it's a Eric Stahl of, is hey, he's what a second line player most of the time. You know, is Eric Stahl, you know, five, six years ago, sure. Now, I don't know. Like, so you know, they've had a lot of failures developing talent or putting talent in the position to succeed. Casey Middlestat, top 10 pick, who's not really bringing much to the table. Um, it, the way Waro, you know, outlined it of, you know, a roster built by three different GMs for three different coaches um, sort of starts to get to the, the heart of the issue at play uh, of what they're, they're dealing with here. And, you know, the system would probably be a lot better if Jack Eichel was scoring uh, because that for a while, at least, before, you know, the last two weeks kind of throws everything out the window because they've just been so bad. But before everything happened with COVID, they were a pretty good team defensively and their goalie gets hurt. And then they, they, they're not playing well defensively at all. They're allowing a ton of scoring chances, but um, you know, COVID is an element here. You know, that was a, a wrench that they didn't expect to be thrown into everything. And um, maybe they have long COVID. Ralph got it himself. Um, and I, you don't want to really downplay what that could have done, but at the same time, he's out there, he's coaching, you know, he's and not doing it well. Um, and you wonder how long it can go on where they keep losing the same way over and over again. You know, as I mentioned in the satchel, which returns uh, tomorrow, I made a pledge that if Ralph Kruger is the, uh, the head coach of the Sabres in 2021-2022, I will ride a tricycle around Lafayette Square. I don't know. It's, it's seemed funny to write. Are I think it looks capable of riding. I think it looks funnier in print. It would have to be a large tricycle. I'd but I think a, a unicycle. I can't, I can't know. I can't do a unicycle. I think a tricycle. They um, make those giant exercise tricycles. You could almost look like you think you're cool and you're riding around in some newfangled technology. Uh, no, I don't. That's I such think a weird that, thing to say. Be like, yeah, you know, if, if Ralph Kruger is the coach, I'm going to eat an ice cream cone upside down. Like, it's not like a bad thing. I'm going to ride a tricycle. Right. Oh, yeah. well, I'm going to go out for a it would be a pretty. Ride. It would be an embarrassing thing, wouldn't it? You know, like, just to see, like, what's this asshole doing? I mean, I see what you're saying, because I think you're thinking of, like, the cartoons with, like, the fat guys on the tricycle or something like that. Yeah, you could fat get, guy on a tricycle. You're right. Just because your bike has three wheels and you're riding around in a circle doesn't mean, like, you're shamed. It's not like being tired and feathered, I don't think. You're thinking I would like hope not. You're you're thinking like Bozo on the tiny tricycle riding around. That's right. <laughs> right. It has to be a specific and after he did the tricycle. Dub. Or no, right. before it's, it's he did a, the dub. It's not a guy, you know. <laughs> it's Bozo. Should I I guess I'll add something to it then? I'll ride a tricycle. I'll leave it up. Maybe we'll have a discussion. This this the satchel runs tomorrow. I can add to it. I'll ride a you know, I can't say like naked or something like that or greased up or I don't know. I'll have to I'll throw an added element on top of the the, bis, the tricycle ride around Lafayette Square. But, I, you know, I, I think it right now, you know, Ralph Kruger's days are numbered as uh, Sabres coach. It's just a matter of the Pagula's pride and how long it allows um, allows them to to let it go on. You know, they also have to wait for a coach to. You can't, it's not the same as it would have been um, two years ago. You have to wait for a coach to quarantine. Um, they fired their coach in Rochester uh, or moved on from their coach in Rochester. Now they have a new coach who's probably not ready to be an NHL coach. So many uh, talented people are with other teams right now and under contract. You would at least have to wait until the season's over before interviewing them or going, you know, yes. Unless Cole is. Julian is at the Harbor Center 
doing his quarantine and that's why it's taking so long. As soon as his 14 day quarantine is done, they're going to bring him in unless there's something like that going on, um, which I wouldn't, you know, Bruce Boudreaux. Right. I wouldn't rule out. Yeah. Bruce Boudreaux is just, you know, hanging out in the executive suite at the, uh, I think we could rule it. I I mean, I think there could be uh, that would be the, probably the best, case scenario for them it's like you'd have so you, to and because you, you'd also need to be sign. you'd need to sign that coach to a you know what a three-year contract to even get them to do it you're not going to find a coach to finish out the year i think if you want to do it the right way um it's wait until the end of the season interview you know do do it the right way uh and yes look we've seen the pagulas and their hockey people or whoever they trust along the way, get it wrong so many times that to limit your chances of being successful by picking from a finite group of available people right now, um, you're asking for a miracle uh, to occur, to get it right. At least at the end of the season, having the, all the options, all the availability to interview, yes, they have shown no, no. Do you almost want fewer options? Do you almost want <laughs> to be like, it should be. Do you almost want to be like, look, Claude Julian, Bruce Boudreaux, oh. both really good. Both have done it before. Like just pick one. Like, yeah, they, there's a certain floor. Let's not get cute. There. Let's not right. go outside the box with the you Ralph open it up. You interview 12 guys. Somebody impresses you for some weird reason and you get stuck on him and it's, man, he did a great job in the world cup of hockey. He's a great communicator or right. this guy used to be a captain of the Sabres. So maybe this will work or bump yeah. into Darius Kilgore and, and have him wow him with some uh, words of wisdom and say, you know what, we're really going outside the box and we're going to have a lacrosse guy be our coach, well, which is too much. What's that, Jonah? I said, don't give him any ideas. <laughs> well, that's where I think Matthew's got a point. Too many yeah, maybe options. opening like, it up. Is maybe, just, maybe I mean, Brian Dable's ready to be a head coach. Maybe you <laughs> give him some experience. Put that on his hometown guy. In I think coach. sometimes the simplest answer is the. And he's best a Canadian. Answer. Brian Dable's a native Canadian. You know he's got hockey yeah. in his blood. I mean, Rich Crozier, he has hockey in his blood. He's won a lot of games in Western New York. Maybe you it's, give him an opportunity. Right at St. Joe's, might as well. That would actually be kind of cool, right? Be a fun story, wouldn't it? Fire Kruger and say, all right, Rich, Rich Crozier from St. Joe's High School. I'm sorry, I don't want to. I know, what are they? The St. Saint, Saint Saint Joseph's Joseph's Intercollegiate Institute, Institute yeah. or Academy Inst- Institute. Institute. Uh, you are going to finish out the season. I think that would be fun, at least for the soap opera aspect of this team. I would appreciate them giving Coach Crozier a shot and seeing how it goes. And it's a legacy hire that would be. Right up the Pugula's alley, I think. That's right. Hey, uh, let's talk about basketball, but we'll do so right after this important message from our sponsor. Tim Graham and Friends is brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. CTBK is a leading accounting firm with a growing team of accountants and business consultants with roots in Amherst, New York. CTBK pairs every project with a focus on a human connection between its team and the client for assurance, accounting, taxes, litigation support, and advice on mergers and acquisitions, CTBK is available and ready to solve any issue your business faces. For a consultation or to request a quote, call 716-630-2400. Again, that's 716-630-2400. CTBK, over a quarter century of proven accounting and business excellence for Western New York, and beyond. It is March, so let's take a spin around Western New York hardwood and maybe also talk some basketball. Uh, We have some tournaments uh, to discuss. Uh, Jonah, let's start with St. Bonaventure. Things keep going well for the Bonnies, and uh, what do you think their outlook is for the NCAA tournament? Well, I think they're in. Uh, that maybe right. Well, that I mean, like ago. in terms of seeding, I mean, have they done enough? Well, to... But 
heading into the start of the Atlantic 10 tournament, so they played two Atlantic 10 tournament games over the weekend, and now they're off and will play the Atlantic 10 final on Sunday against VCU. And as of a week or so ago, it, it wasn't so certain that St. Bonaventure was in, even though I kind of thought they should be, and, and maybe some people thought they deserved to be, but in all the projections, it wasn't, they weren't a lock. They were still a bubble team. But they won the Atlantic 10 regular season title outright. Now they're the number one seed reaching the final against the number two seed. Uh, where they are, they're in the 27 in the net, 27 in Ken Palm, uh, effectively 33rd in the AP voting, 31 in sports reference, simple rating system, which I like to use, especially in a season like this one. It's the best team at this point in the season that they've had in 50 years, winning percentage-wise and where they are record-wise. So they're definitely in. Now it's a matter of how high they will be seeded. I think if you do some of the math on those ratings, they could be have an argument for an eight or a nine seed if they win this A-10 final. I'm not sure they really will get that, but I could argue that they're deserving of being on the top half of the bracket. And at that point, you start thinking you're a team that can make it to the second weekend or at least win a game and contend for a second weekend spot. It'd be tough if you have to play a number one seed, but if you're in the top half of the bracket, you should win a game in the NCAA tournament, which Bonner hasn't done in the first round proper in 50 years, 51 years. 50 tournaments. I'll have to dust off that uh, 50th anniversary a story I did on St. Bonaventure's Final Four team um, because there was no tournament last year. So this is the 50th edition of the NCAA tournament. It's the 50th anniversary, though, of that 1971 team that was the last team that was ranked. They reached the NIT Final Four and ended up beating Duke in the third place game. And was there were only 25 teams in the NCAA tournament that year. So they weren't as good as that 1970 team, but probably as good as any other Bonnet team that's came since. Where do you place their chances? I mean, you've, been, you've seen them throughout the year. I, I don't – let me rephrase that. Not their chances because – then you need to handicap the entire conference. How well do you think they're playing right now as they enter the tournament compared to how good they've been or where they've been at their best during they're the season? They're playing as good as they ever have, better than they have all season, and they've been good for the whole season. But they just beat – let me just make sure I get the score right. They just beat St. Louis by 18 points on a neutral floor. Earlier in the year, they lost to St. Louis by 11, and that was a game where had they won, they probably would have been ranked in the top 25 and maybe – stayed at that level for the remainder of the season. Um, they're shooting the ball better. D Dominic Welch is a player that is one of their best shooters, and he's hot right now. He wasn't so much midway through the season. I think he's been dealing with some injuries. That was kind of part of it. Um, Ocean Oshunier is playing like the best defensive player in the conference and maybe one of the most important players in the league. And Kyle Lofton's a player of the year caliber. He's been playing that way all year, but everything seems to be clicking. They don't have anybody injured or anybody they're missing, really. They're not a deep team. They only play five or six guys most of the time. But as far as the way they like to play and the way they've won this year, they're playing as well as they ever have against better and better teams on the schedule. University of Buffalo closed out its season on Friday with a, an impressive victory to clinch the number two seed in the Mid-American Conference Tournament. They're going to play Miami on Thursday. Um, similar – Situation, I think, for UB, right, Jonah? In fact, in in the in the respect that they are playing at a very high level at just the right time. Oh yeah, absolutely. UB is playing better than they have in two seasons under Jim Whitesell here. So since they were a top twenty-five team a couple of years ago, this is the best stretch they've had. They've won eight and nine games. They've won five in a row. They got different guys: Josh Mabala, Jonathan Williams. Javon Graves is a senior is playing his best basketball of the season. LaQuil Hardnett, they have different players playing well, whereas earlier in the season, it, you know, it was hit or miss on some of these guys. And some of them were out of the lineup, and that was part of the reason why UB wasn't playing well earlier in the season. They had a, a long pause where, you know, we don't know exactly who uh, contracted COVID during that time, but certainly some players did, and I think that affected their recovery and coming back earlier in the season. And, yeah, now they're in a position they have to win the MAC tournament to make the NCAA tournament. They're not going to be an at-large team. There's maybe a small chance that Toledo makes it a two-bid league, but UB is not – doesn't have the record or the non-conference resume to do that. But 
they're playing better than anybody in the league, except maybe Toledo. Toledo is that one team that beat them in the last nine games. But you got to like UB's chances of continuing to play well and probably making it to the MAC final on Saturday night. And then it's one game and they're in the tournament. What I think is interesting, I don't know, I'm not sure if anybody else finds this interesting, but I think it's interesting that UB, where they are in the power ratings and their record, and if they get to the MAC final, being that number two team, in a normal year, I think maybe would have a case to be an NIT team if they don't win that MAC championship game. But this year, it's only 16 teams in the NIT. There's no automatic bids. Not every conference is going to be represented. I don't really think UB, UB is isn't that. very sexy. They're going to be yeah, there yeah. Going to be enough teams with national cachet that will get into the NIT that UB wouldn't have a shot. Right, and there's not going to be any of these CBI CIT tournaments. I don't believe. So it's more of a, you know, you win this tournament and you go to the NCAA tournament or you don't win the tournament and your season is over, which considering where UB is record-wise, they would certainly be playing in, in a more normal postseason. With, right now they have, you know, twice as many wins as losses, and if they win the next two, they'll stay on that trend. All right, now let's uh, look at the MAC. Uh, Canisius and Niagara both playing Okay. I mean, they're, they're not great, but, uh, but they're, they're not bad either. Uh, and this is one of those conferences where so many games are coin flips. Uh, who out of, uh, I'll pose it to you this way, who out of Canisius and Niagara has the best chance to win the MAC tournament and uh, go to the uh, NCAA tournament? Well, Niagara seated higher despite having a worse conference record and a worse overall record. The yeah, that's bizarre. Teams. Can you explain that for people who are listening? Yeah, well, if I understood it, I could explain it. But the way at least I heard it to be, so they both have seven wins but in the conference. And Canisius has five losses, Niagara has nine losses. But they didn't play each other, so there's no head-to-head tiebreaker. You know, for the first time in, I think it was 1966, but first time in a lot of years, they didn't play that rivalry game. They usually play twice, if not more. But they didn't play this year. It was canceled because of COVID-positive tests. And so it went to a tiebreaker system based on who played who, number one seed, number two seed. So Monmouth swept Canisius, I believe this is right, and split with Niagara. So Niagara won the tiebreaker over Canisius when they split it up that way. But they have the same number of wins and four, Canisius is four losses ahead of them in the loss yeah, column. Yeah, so and- Canisius clearly has the better record, but weird tiebreaker yes, because and- of the pandemic. So Kadisha says the sixth seed now is to play a pre-quarter final game tonight against Ryder. So they're going to have to win. If they're going to win the tournament, if you're saying, do they have a better chance than Niagara? They have to win four games. Niagara only has to win three. They're on different sides of the bracket. If they played each other, I'd probably pick Kadisha. But, you know, I, I guess Niagara might have a tougher time because they have to play the number one seed in the quarterfinal if they get there. Kadisha and Niagara have both beaten Sienna, the number one seed this year. So I would say I think Kanisha is a better team than Niagara, but Niagara might have an easier path to the tournament. I'd be surprised if either one of these teams made actually won the MAC, but both of them have a chance to get hot and maybe make a run to the final. Uh, and let's uh, we always have to touch on Damon because they are an elite Division II program. They're about to enter the NCAA tournament. They had a bit of a rough week, but. Uh, Can you give a a synopsis on Damon, men and women, right? Yeah. Well, let me also mention the UB women, if we don't get back around to them, because they also – Yeah, I was going to circle back. Or you want to give a rundown of the Division I women? Well, because that will lead me into what I want to say about Damon. So the UB women are number four seed in the MAC tournament. They're going to have their quarterfinal game on Wednesday. But the difference with that, the reason I want to mention it is because the MAC – has been a two-bid league. I think they got three teams in a couple of years ago in women's basketball. And we were talking to Felicia Leggett-Jack today, and she was talking that, you know, it still is a two-bid league, even though – a multi-bid league, if you will. Even though they haven't really had the non-conference opportunities to prove that in years past. But if UB can make it to the MAC final and maybe they lose that game, especially if it's against the top seed, Bowling Green, who they just beat in the regular season finale, uh, I think they have an opportunity to make the NCAA tournament one way or the other. And, and that's something I think that could definitely happen. And the re- I just want to say that because the exciting thing or the thing to keep an eye on, I think with the U with Damon is their women's team is hosting the division two NCAA tournament this weekend. Right. 
which would have happened either way, whether they qualified or not. They picked hosts ahead of time this year, which isn't always the case, but was for, you know, the pandemic. And they're the number two seed. They're having a very good year. They probably were in position to maybe be the number one seed had they won their conference championship game, but they did not. But they've been ranked, I think, as high as ninth in the country all year long, or they've been ranked all year long. And they're a good team. And this was a team that was on the bus on their way to the NCAA tournament for the first time in program history last year when they got the call that was canceled. And now they get this opportunity to play it again in their home gym, albeit with no fans. But still something that I think Dame is excited to host that event. And then their men's team, which lost in the conference tournament game on Sunday, is going to Albany for the NCAA tournament. So they're going to get the opportunity to keep playing and uh, maybe advance in the NCAA tournament if they can win a couple games in Albany this weekend. And we've been talking about it on uh, the previous incarnation of this uh, show uh, over at uh, 1270 The Fan that uh, – College basketball in Western New York is really impressive. I know we're not talking about the research triangle or anything like that, but um, some super competitive basketball at all levels, men and women, interesting storylines, even, you know, going on with even what happened last year at Niagara. I mean, there is, uh, there's a lot of college basketball news and fast, fascinating stories to be told, but, it, uh, they, they, they seem to slip through the cracks more and more, unfortunately. And it came out today that a team, a UB alumni, uh, mostly all the top players from that nationally ranked team two years ago are going to try to put a team in that million-dollar basketball tournament, the TBT. Now you have to I hadn't qualify. heard that. Yeah, that came out today. You Who's have, on that CJ, team? CJ Massenburg was involved in the announcement, so it seems like he's definitely playing. They put out a, a graphic with a lot of faces. Now what happens with these a lot is – like Syracuse has had a team for many years and they'll put out a roster with a lot of famous Syracuse players and not all of them end up showing up for the tournament, but it looks like all the star players from recent UB teams, CJ Massenburg, Nick Perkins, Jeremy Harris, Wes Clark, Dante Carruthers, really the core of that team that went to the NCAA tournament uh, three out of four years and won a game two years in a row. Jim Horn, Hodgson, Jim Horn play for them? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know if Jim Horn will make it. I was wondering, there's some good players that played, under Reggie Witherspoon and Bobby Hurley a few years before that I wonder if they'll pick up any of them or if it seems very Mark right now with the players. You think yeah, Mark Bortz is Bortz in Bortz shape? Mark wants to get, you know. Friend but of I, the friend of TGAF and for, uh, brought to you by CTBK, Mark Bortz. Right. And, and players that are currently playing in Cleveland right now, you know, they have five guys who participate. Oh, right. They can play. Year. Yeah. And they can also come back. I and mean, we'll have to see how that shakes out with, really every senior in college basketball, but Javon Graves specifically seems like a guy who's going to be trying to play professional after this season, but maybe he will join that TBT team, or maybe if they become an annual team, guys that are on this current team will play with them again. But one thing to note, you have to apply and you have to get a certain level of fundraising and voting from the fans to actually make it to the tournament. There was supposed to be a Bana or there was an attempt to have a Bonnet team in this TBT last year, and they didn't qualify. So just because this UB team is trying to be in the TBT tournament, they might not actually play in the tournament. But, they, you know, that's where it comes down to UB fans probably voting and doing the different things necessary to make that happen. All right. Well, this has been a winter sports cavalcade on Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK. A lot of hockey and a lot of basketball but no downhill skiing. No, um, no, uh, no luge, bobsledding, skeleton, any of the track sports, no biathlon. Now we'll see if we can get, um, maybe do some figure skating later on in the week. Um, okay. Thanks to everybody for listening to Tim Graham and friends brought to you by CTBK. And my thanks, as always, to Jonah Bronstein and Matthew Fairburn.